Welcome everyone. I wanna thank uh, all the participants for signing on to this session on the Main Street Efficiency Act of 2021. I especially wanna thank Congressman Welch and Rick Thigpen for joining me for this important conversation. I am the Chief Sustainability Officer for Wildan, a leading national energy efficiency and resiliency company. I'm also an Alliance board member and I would like to thank the Alliance staff for their great work as usual in organizing EE Global and for enabling this important conversation. We hope to make this as engaging and uh, meaningful as possible in this virtual format. We'll keep it casual and conversational. Uh, brief introductory remarks by myself, by the Congress. We're very excited today to talk to you about a most unique opportunity. It is an opportunity for utilities in our existing ecosystem of energy efficiency companies to help small businesses across the country recover from the COVID-19 shutdown by permanently lowering their monthly energy bills through energy efficient facility upgrades. Now, this is something that utilities all across the country have been doing for decades. They've been doing it on a relatively small scale given the size and magnitude of the need, which has only increased exponentially over the past 14 months, during which time many of these programs have been shuttered. Having been involved in utility SMB, uh, small business energy efficiency programs for decades, I've always thought that quite aside from the environmental benefits that they deliver, they're as good uh, for our communities as any government economic development program. Where else can small businesses turn to get white glove treatment in a program that delivers top quality facility upgrades and improve the work environment, air quality and building asset value while permanently lowering operating costs with the program paying for a majority of the costs. But this important lifeline for small businesses has always relied on their ability to pay their portion of the cost, something that made it difficult for many businesses to participate in these programs in the best of economic times. Given the reality of where these businesses stand today, there's a very real risk that these utility programs may remain effectively sidelined. And those dollars budgeted already for SMB customers may be stuck in utility coffers. The proposed legislation that we'll talk about today, the Main Street Efficiency Act of 2021, is an efficient way to deliver critical federal funding through the utilities existing customer program infrastructure that will allow small businesses to unlock these utility incentive dollars and to make energy efficient upgrades to their facilities at little to no cost. As all of you know from your interactions with your local uh, restaurants, hairdressers, bowling alleys, Main Street USA and the businesses that dot it are the victims of COVID-19 shutdown and they're still sick and ailing as the pandemic uh, subsides. These small businesses represent nearly half of the U.S. GDP. They account for more than half the workforce and a disproportionate amount of the low-wage, lower-educated segments of the workforce. Many of these SMB employees are among the over 7 million people more this February that count themselves on the unemployment rolls than last February. The first quarter reports and surveys of small business owners evidence continuing devastation. Only 20% of small businesses expect to make capital outlays in the next few months. Expectation among small businesses for an economic recovery is at negative 8%. Small business confidence index is at its lowest level ever, 43 out of 100, lower than Q4 of 2019. And with the federal government now poised to address infrastructure and clean energy with a once in a generation initiative, we must recognize that a key to decarbonization <coughs> clean power infrastructure uh, is, is deep energy efficiency retrofits in buildings. Every federal dollar spent through the Main Street Efficiency Act will not only be matched by, but will unlock a dollar or more of private investment by utilities in making their customers more efficient. This utility investment is underwritten by sophisticated regulatory oversight, as it has been for the last 30 years. The regulatory oversight and level of investment varies by state and by utility. And the Main Street Efficiency Act is designed with the flexibility to work in all cases. It is ambivalent to the nuanced details of our industry, including cost benefit testing, measure mix, rate recovery. In all cases, Main Street Efficiency is concerned only with covering the small business customer's payment to participate. It exists to enable businesses to access the money that is already budgeted to help them permanently lower their energy efficiency costs. It's within this context that, uh, that I would. Uh, and a great need and opportunity that I'm delighted to turn the discussion over to the Honorable Peter Welch, uh, who will soon be introducing the Main Street Efficiency Act of 2021 in Congress. 
Vermont's only representative to the House, Congressman Welch has ably represented his state in Congress since 2006. He's well known to the Alliance board and staff and associates as a fearless and effective energy efficiency champion who holds a seat on the powerful House Energy and Commerce Committee and one who has lent his considerable skills and talents generously to the work of the Alliance and EE advocates everywhere as an honorary member of the Alliance's advisory board since 2013. Congressman Welch has a track record of working across the aisle to get legislation in place to help American families and businesses. He was one of the lead authors of the only bipartisan energy bill to be signed into law during Barack Obama's eight years in office. Congressman Welch will explain his bill, but I'd like to say as I turn the talk over to him, how much his work and that of his staff, particularly Alex Piper, has been appreciated by energy efficiency businesses, utilities and advocates across the country. 60 plus businesses and organizations have endorsed this small business program. Many, many more will benefit from its enactment. Representative Welch, the floor is yours and I thank you again for taking the time to be with us today. We at the Alliance and in the industry stand ready to help you move this bill from introduction to implementation. Um, thank you very much. I, re I really appreciate that, Adam, and uh, it's great to be here with you uh, and with Rick as well. And as always, I want to thank uh, the Alliance for the ongoing work that you've done uh, that makes such a difference to support our efforts in Congress for good energy efficiency policy. <clears throat> you know, Adam, you uh, gave a pretty good description, actually a very good description of the Main Street Fairness Act. So I'm not going to go through the details, but there's a couple of things I want to highlight because these uh, one is about the situation we're in as we're coming out of COVID and why the Main Street Efficiency Act can help. Uh, and the second are the obvious benefits of us taking advantage of the Biden administration commitment uh, on infrastructure and on climate change. You know, first, Adam, you talked about the small businesses. Main Street Efficiency would provide $6.2 billion uh, to utilities to use to help our businesses uh, be more efficient and to save money. And oh, by the way, it'll reduce carbon emissions. And everything that they do in order to save energy means local jobs. In fact, about 60,000 jobs would be created. But you made a point that we've got to remind ourselves of. We're, we're turning a corner on COVID. And what we're seeing is that some of the major companies are doing well. Uh, there's a pent up demand. There's sectors of our economy that are going to be humming soon. But our small businesses that are so much uh, essential to community life have really been reeling with uh, the effects of COVID and how it's required a slowdown in activity. And in fact, we lost uh, uh, thousands and thousands of energy efficiency jobs. So if we're gonna come out of, the, of, out of COVID, and by the way, everybody get vaccinated as soon as you can and go back to normal, we have to focus some efforts on the small businesses that have actually really suffered and are gonna be struggling to get back on their feet. Now, what better way to help than to assist them through programs that already exist using the skills of our utilities where we're not reinventing the wheel. We're taking advantage of systems that are in place with proven capacity to produce results and giving that jumpstart with that financial incentive so that those jobs we lost can be created. So, what I like about the Main Street Fairness uh, Efficiency Act is how it takes advantage of what works. It takes advantage of what works. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're taking the skills of utilities. We're taking the workforce skills uh, that can be applied to the implementation of efficiency measures. Uh, we're taking into account the fact that there's not a one size fits all. Uh, that business on one side of the street may have different efficiency challenges than that business on the other side of the street. So uh, this is like common sense. Uh, and we try to do that occasionally in Congress. And uh, I, 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 uh, so I'm really excited about this. Uh, and that's something uh, that my uh, colleague in the Senate, Senator Cor Cortez uh, Mastro, 
who is the lead sponsor in the Senate, uh, feels very strongly about as well. You know, the second uh, point uh, is that climate change is real, and we know that, but we've had a contentious debate about it. But you know what? We don't have to necessarily persuade folks who don't say agree with my position on climate change that there's a real advantage to energy efficiency. You know, in Vermont years ago, when I was in the state Senate, Vermont created an efficiency utility. And that was based on the fact that the cheapest energy that we can get is through efficiency rather than generated uh, and, and transmitted onto the grid. And it helped us in Vermont significantly lower our bills and our demand. And why not? If we can avoid the added cost of generation through efficiency, that's money in the pocket of the ratepayer. It's a really, really smart thing to do. And if we're going to get to a, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, and Adam, you did as well, this is local jobs that are good jobs. You know, in Vermont, like a lot of our country, we're having a struggle to, uh, uh, to increase population, actually, to get folks to be able to afford to live here uh, and have a good life here. We love our state, uh, but there has to be affordability in keeping those uh, utility rates down, which is one of the effects of using less energy. Whatever the source, as Adam mentioned, it's agnostic on that. It's just whatever source you're using, use less of it. That's less expensive. So jobs, uh, savings. Uh, and of course, there is a reduction in carbon emissions. And I am one of the folks who believes really strongly that that is really essential. So you combine this with the commitment the uh, Biden administration has uh, to climate change. And this is a tool that will be one of the tools that assist us in uh, reaching the carbon emission reductions the president seeks. And number two, the jobs that are created Number three, the help that we can give by lowering expenses for many of our small businesses that so many of you work with. Uh, this is, to use the jargon of Washington, a win-win-win. Uh, so it's so wonderful to be uh, part of this. And I've always appreciated the work of the Alliance in your capacity to get so many enterprises together where all of you are doing different things. In many uh, places, you might even be competing but you're united on your efforts to have smart policies that are gonna enable you to reduce electric, bill, er, electric and fuel bills for the people you serve. So Adam and Rick, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure uh, to be with you again. Very nice. Th thank you, Congressman. I appreciate your, your remarks and look forward to the discussion. Um, I'll turn it over now to uh, our next guest, Rick Thigpen, Senior Vice President for Corporate Citizenship and a member of the Executive Officers Group at, uh, at PSE&G in New Jersey, uh, someone I've had a great opportunity to work with in the past uh, and on, on uh, the, the commitment, the great commitment that his company has made to, uh, to clean energy and helping their customers in New Jersey. Rick started his career at PSE&G in 2007, he was Vice President for State Government Affairs. His roots go deep in New Jersey. Um, he has served for many years with the staff uh, of Congressman Don Payne in, in New Jersey, uh, as well as a tenure at the New Jersey State Democratic Committee as its executive director. Rick is a graduate of Brown University, holds a law degree from Columbia. Uh, Rick will talk to us about the important work PSCNG has proposed uh, and the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities approved late last year to drive energy efficiency across the state. He'll uh, focus particularly on how the program proposed by Congressman Welch and the Main Street Efficiency Act could support and expand the efforts plan to drive energy efficiency with small businesses in New Jersey. So, Rick, the floor is all yours. Good morning, Congressman. Good morning, Adam. So, Adam, thank you for those kind words, and thank you to the Alliance for Save Energy to uh, convene this forum. And, Congressman Welch, I just want you to know that your reputation precedes you in New Jersey, and... It is an alarmingly rare characteristic to hear people speak of a public servant with such, you know, about such decency and character and really commitment to public service. So I really want to thank you and, and really commend you. And I want the public to hear that because unfortunately it's too rare to hear 
And people say that about our public servants today. So you all have raised some very, very important topics today, and there's so many ways to cover it. And I want to talk about what public service here in New Jersey is doing. But Adam, you started with sustainability, and that is the word that we all need to learn to live by because we all love our children and we all want to pass our planet on in a healthy state to them. And as our president has talked about, we are going to build back better from this pandemic. And there is no doubt that energy efficiency is a key part of that building back better and moving forward together. So here at Public Service, we have a vision we call Powering Progress. And in Powering Progress, we talk about using less energy being the fundamental part of Powering Progress, as well as the energy that we use being cleaner and having it delivered more reliably. I'm sure both of you know the experience of now working from home and reliability standards for downtown commercial districts are much higher than they are for us working at home. So that issue is out there waiting for us in the world of utilities. But today we're here to talk about energy efficiency and it is quite an outstanding topic. It is the key. And whose grandmother didn't tell them, turn out the lights when you leave a room. And that's how it starts, but it goes much beyond that. We all have a personal a responsibility to use less energy because we Americans are energy hogs. And as the Congressman talked about, reducing our energy usage is a win, win, win scenario. It's a win for the environment. It's most importantly a win for people's pocketbooks. And it can also be a win for the shareholders of utility companies when structured correctly and providing utilities the incentive to do the job is just what the Main Street Efficiency Act is about, and a job which many utilities like public service here in New Jersey is excited about. And you know, public service starts with the role of universal access. We have the responsibility to provide universal access to energy, electricity, and gas in our case, to all of our customers. And who better to provide universal access to energy efficiency services than the people who are already in your home, already responsible for your energy usage? And so we are very excited about the Main Street Efficiency Act. There's lots of wisdom in it. There's lots of opportunity. And as the Congressman mentioned, it's using what works. And what works in New Jersey is uh, we have a long history of pursuing a clean energy future under the leadership of our current governor. And New Jersey does have a long Atlantic coastline, 130 miles of Atlantic coastline. So we are quite familiar with the impacts of climate change already, Congressman. Many of us in New Jersey don't need to be convinced anymore because we felt it, particularly in the form of Superstorm Sandy, which wrecked, which wreaked enormous damage on our state. And most of us don't want to see that again. So having this act come about, making the federal government our partner is something we are extremely excited about. We really want to commend you for the way you're thinking and having the public sector be our partner in, in performing this essential mission of reducing energy usage is absolutely important. And Congressman, I'll add one more constituency to that constituency of small businesses saving, which our small businesses create most of the jobs. They are a lifeline to our economy and they're so essential. Also, local governments can use less energy by using energy efficiency, and that's called property tax relief in New Jersey. And I have yet to meet the elected official who's opposed to property tax relief for their constituents. So we find energy efficiency to be incredibly important. And we find that having the utility as a partner is the way to deliver universal access. There are many Americans who don't have the time, the expertise, and sometimes the money to now do the things you know beyond turning out the lights when you leave a room to save energy, which is buying more efficient appliances, having sensors, et cetera, et cetera. And so the utility under government supervision is the perfect partner to make sure that those opportunities are universally available to all the customers so that we can save as much money or save as much energy as possible and not only leave it to those who are wealthy. You know, in our world, Wall Street and Park Avenue already are adopting energy efficiency techniques because they are focused on their bottom line. So bringing energy efficiency to Main Street is an incredibly important mission. We're all gonna benefit from it. And I look forward to talking more about the very important role of equity, universal access, using energy efficiency purposefully to create jobs and to be an economic stimulus tool and because our inner cities and disadvantaged neighborhoods need to join the crusade to save energy, energy efficiency provides a unique opportunity to provide stimulus in these communities at the same time. 
So I'm very excited to hear about the Main Street Efficiency Act. It's a real privilege to join you all today and to share the stage with a congressman whose reputation is honorable. And I'm looking forward to a discussion about a very exciting topic, energy efficiency. And I want to just thank you all for what you're doing. Thank you, Rick. Uh, thank you for all that you and your, your uh, wonderful company are doing in New Jersey and, and for agreeing to join us in this conversation. So let's, uh, let's get right into it. And I, I have some questions prepared and I uh, will go maybe right to the elephant in the room, Congressman Welch, if you will indulge me. Um, first of all, you talked about the fact that these, these projects are not necessarily just some, some green initiative, right? I mean, this is good for business. And I can tell you as someone who started my career as a sales auditor, you know, small businesses don't participate in these programs to, to save the planet. They, they are trying to save their business, most of them, on a month-to-month -month basis, right? So they're participating because it makes good sense in the cost savings, and, and it's, a, it's a great investment for them in, in the future of their business. So you've been masterful at getting uh, and building consensus around energy efficiency bills uh, throughout your tenure. Uh, the political appetite today, from those of us who are spectators outside the Beltway, the political appetite for bipartisanship uh, appears to be at an all-time low. So can you give us your thoughts on whether Republicans can or will support the Main Street Efficiency Act? Can you handicap at all the chances you see for this program that's being called for in your bill be included in a bill that makes it uh, to President Biden's desk? Well, how we'll get it to the president's desk, uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, but I think we can. I think we can. Whether we get the Republican support in Congress remains to be seen. Uh, and that's the whole January 6th situation that we have. <clears throat> but here's why I think there's reason to be optim optimistic. First of all, when you break this down into what are we talking about? It's not an ideological point of view that suits a Democratic agenda or a Republican agenda. <clears throat> this is something that basically says that with government policy and private sector engagement, we're gonna use less of the fuel source and save money uh, and make our businesses more prosperous and create more jobs. I don't have any Republican colleagues who are against that. They like it, all right? Our problem in DC is that so much uh, of the overhang uh, of the kind of ideological battle and the uh, challenges that we've had with uh, trust in government uh, sometimes interfere. And another thing that's always in play in Washington <clears throat> are the politics of who's going to be in, <clears throat> pardon me, in the majority the next time. <clears throat> and that remains to be seen. But the fact that you have an administration that's totally supportive of this, uh, the fact that we've had a number of wonderful Republican colleagues of mine who have been leaders on energy efficiency, people like Adam Kinzinger, people like Bob Latta, people like uh, uh, Mr. McKenzie, uh, or McKinley, I'm sorry, my, my soulmate on so many things, David McKinley from West Virginia. These folks totally understand and get it. So it's not ideological, whether at the leadership level, uh, there's in a capacity to try to declare a truce on things we agree on, and move them, which is my preference. You know, we agree on A, B, and C, let's do them. Let's get it to the president's desk. So I'm always an advocate of doing what we can. And then if we disagree on D, E, uh, D, and E, well, we can have our fight, have our vote, and see if we can get it through. So you can't be in this uh, business, Adam, as you know, without uh, uh, having some optimism that is worth the effort. And as you mentioned, we did get some energy efficiency bills passed. And my hope is that we're going to be able to do it again. And the reason, again, I come back to why I think that's possible is that this makes sense, whether you're in a district that voted for Trump or you're in a district that voted for Biden. It's really good for your community. Okay, I appreciate that. And it is encouraging. Uh, you know, I've, I've paid some attention to... Uh, some of the Energy and Commerce Committee meetings recently and, and heard from some of your Republican colleagues. And I, I, I share your optimism. I think we've made a lot of progress in terms of arguing about whether the climate's changing, whether, the, whether it's warming, right? So the discussion now, is, I think, is about tactics. 
uh, to moving to to decarbonize the economy, and that's a great place for the conversation to have to have gotten to. Rick, if I could for a moment, you you mentioned something about um, some you know the the economic disparity that the congressman referred to, where we have big companies doing well and small businesses suffering, and that does apply to to this move to a clean energy economy and taking advantage of. Uh, lower costs through energy efficient upgrades and frankly taking advantage of utility incentives. And big businesses have the wherewithal to do this, right? They've got the time to figure these things out, fill out applications. Um, small businesses make up as many as 96% of all commercial customers for utility and about 50% of the, of the sales or the, or the load. Um, but they definitely require more of a, a handholding and, and an outreach. Uh, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I've got a little inside information on the fact that um, while most programs, uh, uh, portfolios tend to underinvest because it's hard to get to those customers, I know that PSE and G is not doing that. Can you talk a little bit about how you see uh, getting participation from small businesses uh, in in meeting your goal, making sure that they're being served equitably as as large businesses? So first off, let me agree with you 100%. It, 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 is, it is difficult for penetration. And there is, no, there is zero wisdom in leaving behind those who don't want to, who are not able to volunteer or have the money to participate in terms of achieving our goal of reducing our energy usage. So that's why this is so important. Okay, so, uh, so we start there. So number one is the utility has something we call patient capital. We don't require the kind of returns immediately that many small businesses have. Additionally, we have expertise. A lot of small businesses don't have expertise in investing in energy saving. And so frequently they don't do it. And so we are an excellent partner. We have government oversight of our activities. And like I said, we have responsibility for universal access. So we are now running programs to be in touch with our local businesses, to offer them programs to evaluate their energy usage, to provide programs with some financial support for paying back the expense of the program and to provide zero interest on bill financing to help increase the accessibility and to target those customers, you know, in terms of our marketing and to have them understand both this is a benefit for them as well as a benefit for the state in terms of trying to achieve its goals. And I think the Congressman is accurate. There's, it's the rare business that doesn't want to save money. It can be an issue that can evade partisanship, but there are some issues that are raised on how public funds get used in terms of provide, you know, means testing would be my simple word for it in terms of who is eligible to receive ratepayer subsidies to do their energy efficiency work. Some people unfortunately characterize that in a negative light, but those programs are a very important part. It is hard to expect the local pizza parlor to take away from their core business and focus on energy usage issues and decide where to spend their money and when they're gonna get their payback, et cetera. But it does make perfect sense with the public <coughs> sector watching us closely for the utility to come in, talk to them, make assessments, make the investments so they can reduce their energy usage over a long period of time and pay it back in an affordable fashion. And we are on that mission now. It is part of New Jersey's clean energy future. And at the end of the day, we all recognize that climate change is out there. And we all recognize that the cheapest way to, re you know, to save on climate change is to reduce energy usage. And we all recognize that there is also enormous economic opportunity in servicing those small businesses. And I'll, I'll add again, also local government buildings into these programs to have them reduce their energy usage. You can create opportunity for small businesses. You can create jobs at the same time. And so we kind of have a partner in New Jersey in terms of the uh, uh, government helping us penetrate the marketplace, but it's a very important mission. And, and we believe that the Main Street Efficiency Act is going to help facilitate making that mission more successful. Great, Rick, thank you, I appreciate that. So Congressman Welch, let me, let me ask you if I could, uh, and I, I wanna get something, maybe reiterate something that was in my introduction for, for the audience, and I know you're aware, I'd like to get your impression of it. Um, 
during the last stimulus, we saw um, our industry primarily saw energy efficiency conservation block grants that helped that helped, and they did. Uh, it would flow down through state and local governments, um, but there was challenges with how that money would be would be used, the regulatory, the strings to it, and they, they were, those challenges were for good reason to make sure the money was well spent. I, I believe that there are two really unique elements to this federal program. One being that it utilizes the existing utility ecosystem. So that ecosystem is there. It's it's subcontractors and unit pricing and and uh, and a mature set of uh, solution providers for small businesses, um, and also the regulatory oversight. Right. So if we just simply took that it's fifty cents on a dollar that a utility is going to pay for the efficiency, and this program from the federal government would pay the other fifty cents. The, the the overseen by a public utility commission in a state. Um, and so we know that the money is, is being well spent. So I think there's, there's that added layer of insurance and, and also speed to market for this, these federal dollars, which is important because I, I think that this program could be seen as long-term economic stimulus, but it certainly can be viewed as short-term uh, recovery, right? So I'm, I'm curious your impression of th this unique part of this, this bill. But, you know, Adam, that's really, I think, the strength of this. Uh, you, 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 this is what I meant by a public-private par partnership, and also where public policy can facilitate and leverage the capacity of the private market to get things done that it does much better than government. But it needs that policy nexus in order to have that opportunity so that cl your clients can take up the opportunity of actually implementing energy efficiency. So what you said is exactly right. You've got utilities, they've got their systems in place. They don't have to reinvent the wheel or set up a whole new set of systems. Also, you made a point about regulation that really is smart. You know, regulations sometimes can be overdone, uh, but sometimes they can be very helpful, uh, especially when, as you mentioned, you use the word mature, they do achieve the goal of setting standards uh, because that is the best guarantee that, in fact, the money spent on efficiency is going to achieve the efficiency results uh, that we all want. Um, they become known to people uh, who have to uh, work with them and comply with them. Uh, so it can, in, in a, in, it really then protects the public uh, to give confidence that the money in the program is going to be wisely uh, deployed. So the fact that we have this infrastructure it's been hurt uh, with COVID and we lost a lot of jobs, but it's there and it's been there and now has an opportunity to go back to work in effect, show up and uh, start doing the work as opposed to try to reinvent it. I think it's a big asset of the main, uh, the main street bill. Right, and, and Rick, following up on the, the very simplistic view of a, of a customer project where 50% is paid by the utility and 50% by the Main Street Efficiency Act to cover the customer's copay, psc and would be the flip side of that, right? So the way you see it is you've got pressure from uh, consumer advocates and from your regulators around how much you spend on these programs. Now, you have an approved budget, and you're moving forward with it. Um, you talked about customer financing, which is pretty unique to PSENG, to offer that the customer copayment can be put on their bill and paid back over time. In our experience in selling these projects to small businesses, that can improve the, the participation rates by 20 or 30%. I mean, it's significant. Uh, this would be, uh, the Main Street Efficiency Act would for a, a short period of time, or for maybe three years, um, provide the ability for the, that customer to not have to repay that loan, right? This is now a grant paying the customer's portion uh, rather than the on-bill financing. So I'm curious what you, uh, what maybe a, an earlier quick impression from the company would be of your ability to, to not have to lay that money out as loans and collect it back from customers on their bill, but rather have a grant from the federal government that allows you kind of to wipe out that, that repayment. If well, that Yes. So first off, we are prepared to do it either way. Number one, um, public-private partnership is what the name of the game is for us to achieve our goals broadly as our society. So we're very excited about that. 
And, you know, um, necessity is the mother of invention. And on bill financing, Adam, as you correctly observed, is one of the ways to get more people to participate in these programs that we know need to be conducted. And Congressman, I will mention that your committee chairman is a former member of the New Jersey State Legislature. So he has sort of been quite familiar with the journey and challenges of New Jersey in terms of clean energy, are dealing with our own coastline. And so we are adopting these uh, techniques as a practical way to get people to participate. We have to have an eye on affordability. I think California has taught us all a lesson with energy efficiency, that there is wisdom in spending money to reduce energy usage. There is political noise that comes with that concept of spending money to reduce energy usage, but it can be done wisely, it can be done effectively, and it's almost impossible to contemplate achieving the goals of reducing energy usage without spending money. But there's always those who will say, well, how are you gonna spend money to reduce my bill? That doesn't make sense that I gotta pay for this and my bill's gonna go down. And so there's a constant education process that goes with it. Obviously, sometimes it's possible for rates to increase, but people's bills go down because they use less. And that equation can easily be demagogued and made to appear to be, you know, inappropriate or, you know, or untrue for people. But it is a real challenge to march down that road to get a public-private partnership to reduce energy usage. The congressman's bill is one way, or on bill financing is another way. You know, I'm sure there, there are more ways we could talk about, but I'll end it with where I started. Necessity is the mother of invention, and we've got to find the ways to make it work together. Rick, let me stick with you on another issue that I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up. So the uh, through the hard work of the Alliance staff, and, and as I mentioned, Alex Piper and congressman's staff, uh, Congressman's office. There's some very strong equity language uh, yes. in in this bill, and yes. I didn't mention in my intro, but I sh but I would wanted to that there's a multiplier effect because most of the industry that does energy efficiency work, the clean energy jobs of auditing and retrofitting these buildings, uh, are done by small businesses, small right? Business. So there's kind of a this knock on effect here. Um, so uh, I wonder if you could talk just a little bit. Again, I've got some inside information on PSCNG being very aggressive with this, but I, I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about in the Clean Energy Fund programs that you're rolling out, um, how you folks see equity participation <coughs> by minority communities, participation in, by dis, in disadvantaged communities. Yeah, quite a big issue. Thank you very much for that question, Adam. First off, as we talk about build back better, that means not repeating uh, some of the shortcomings of the past that, in fact, we pay attention as we go forward to create opportunity for all. That green jobs in the cities is not necessarily a bad idea, but a good idea. That focusing on having, as the Main Street Efficiency Act does, having uh, minority businesses participate in the economic part of actually delivering the services can create some synergy, in fact. So very important. So in the case of, of public service in New Jersey, as I talked about before, you know, energy efficiency is not glamorous. It doesn't attract a lot of attention. You don't do TV ads about it. You know, turn out the lights. You know, that's as exciting as it gets almost. But it is an absolute necessity. Energy efficiency, uh, you know, are, there are those who can say, well, I don't want to see money spent to save energy because that means bills go up for those who don't participate, not go, you know, not go down. And that's the only way we can get on this journey. What we discovered was, in fact, there's a broad constituency out there in New Jersey to make energy efficiency a strong and smart public policy if it includes equity, if it includes both targeting the communities that need to reduce their energy usage and includes creating opportunity for those who can be a part of our recovery and can be a part of building a new economy that is more inclusive. It is a very challenging concept and we're walking through it right now together there are those who are always there to throw stones at it and to call in the question, well, are you giving incentive payments to people to use minority businesses? Is that appropriate? You know, things like that are out there. And I, think, I don't think it's inappropriate to mention them. But overall, the strength of broadening participation in business opportunity, broadening participation in job opportunity, and making sure that there's universal access to energy efficiency makes the word equity 
not just a nice word, but a word that has political power in it to help get our our energy, our one billion dollar energy efficiency program authorized. It brought into partnership with our public utility in with organizations like our state NAACP that don't traditionally support utility programs. And it gave elected officials across our state, our legislative black and Latino caucuses, something to focus on in terms of energy policy that they don't normally focus on because it was about making their communities better as well. So we have found equity to be a powerful political tool, a powerful business tool, and a powerful public policy tool to help make our state better and help us move forward on this necessary journey of all of us participating in the job of saving energy. And I could really go down that road further. There's lots of little details in there, but equity is not just a kind word, but Congressman, as you know, equity is not for the faint of heart in the world of politics. It does require a battle, but it is absolutely, nece absolutely necessary to build back better and to have a brighter future where more Americans can participate than we're able to participate in the past. Thanks, Rick. Congressman, kind of building on this issue, and I, we do hear a lot from the administration about um, uh, trying to uh, um, use the clean move to a clean energy economy to maybe repay for some of the sins of the past, right? Where, where we've had communities that have been disproportionately affected by the way we looked at energy in the past. Um, as, a, as an undying energy efficiency advocate, I try to listen to the objections. And as I've learned how things work on Capitol Hill, I try to listen to, to the other side, the people we need to help convince, right? And in listening to your committee members, um, they, they seem to have one really good objection still to this rapid move, which is we're not exactly walking people out of coal mines and into clean energy jobs, right? I do think the future of clean energy will have more jobs than, than the old way we looked at energy. But there's this transition issue, right? And another thing I looked at is, I think there are five members on your committee, or at least five members in Congress, who represent either a county that has the word carbon in it, or a city that has the word carbon in it. So sitting in New York talking about decarbonization, we have to remember in the representative form of government where these folks are coming from. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about when you talk to, to Representative McKinley and others, how you deal with the fact that there are different opportunities over different timelines as we move towards decarbonization? Well, first of all, we've got to acknowledge that there is disruption and that's very painful in the coal mining communities. I went to uh, the Harrison Mine in West Virginia with David McKinley. Uh, we went down a thousand feet and then got on a coal car at four and a half miles in and spent time with miners who were uh, mining a SEMA coal. Uh, and they were mining it on the wall and it was going into a conveyor belt and taken out to uh, a landing station about six miles away. But I got to tell you, uh, I never met people who worked so hard and were so proud of their communities and those coal miners. And David McKinley is completely dedicated to their well-being. So, and it's been really tough in coal country. Now, some people have argued it's the EPA. Well, in fact, uh, the market has really changed on coal. It's not just uh, it's not just the the climate change issue. The move to natural gas as a more affordable alternative to coal has really cost a lot of jobs. And mechanization is astonishing. You know, when we were down there in that coal mine, and I was seeing these huge machines that were just carving the coal off the off the wall. The number of miners that we were with was probably a dozen, whereas in the old days that might have been two or three hundred. So this is tough, but later when we were having lunch together, I acknowledged to the miners, I said, you know, I'm from Vermont, the Green Mountain State, and we don't have any coal, but we do have electricity. And I thank them for keeping the lights on in our barns, uh, in our homes, in our schools. So, uh, Adam, what you said, we all have to acknowledge, and it, this is uh, th this is really disruption in, uh, in 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 the lives of some communities. And in fact, that community we were at Friday nights, they all go to football games. And uh, several years ago, they had twelve high schools, or uh, uh, and now they have like three. And you can imagine what that does to communities. So, a major part of the uh, transformation 
uh, and transformations have occurred at other times in our economy, has to include a commitment to those communities and those people who've served us so well for so long. Yeah, and I wish we had more time. We really are up against it here. And I and I so I I I will end on the fact that what a great coalition if we could bring together uh, in our cause the environmental justice communities that Rick talked about and these communities that have worked so hard and passionately worked in, in the advancement of energy uh, in the communities that Representative McKinley talks about. If we can bring that coalition together, it would really be something. So I, that's a positive note to end on. And I want to thank, again, uh, Congressman Welch and Rick Thigpen for your time today and, uh, and for your continued work in advancing these important policies and actions. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Rick. And thank you to the Alliance. Exactly. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Adam. And thank you to the Alliance. It's a great topic. And, and, and thank you for the Main Street Efficiency Act.